Hello, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce someone that I... No, I think now it works. Um, yeah, so someone who probably doesn't need much introducing here, uh, Rahel Yaegi, so, um, who's a professor of practical philosophy, social philosophy, philosophy of law uh, at Humboldt University, um, and who has uh, been a guest professor, a visiting professor at Yale, uh, um, the New School of Social Research, who's been a, a fellow of the IAS at Princeton, um, and who's written um, many books, including one on alienation, one on the critique of forms of life, and a new one that maybe she will tell us about today. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to hearing you talk. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, well, sorry, try not to get this. Oh, yeah, I probably forgot the evident part of, she's uh, the co-head of the Center uh, for right. Social Critique in Berlin. <laughs> that is part of this event. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, thank you, Thomas, for organizing all of this and also for having us on board uh, here. Sorry, is it okay? So when I had to come up with a title, uh, I think, Thomas, uh, the first title he announced was Progress and Regression, thinking about my upcoming book. And I then changed it to Defending Materialism, but in some way, uh, it is about both. It is... Uh, uh, not defending materialism as such, but with respect to what I conceive of as a materialist account of social change. So it's not new materialism, not so much new about it. It's uh, rather old-fashioned historical materialism or a materialist theory of history that I'm interested in here. Um, and even if this is part of a more comprehensive project to come that... Uh, uh, will go under the title normative materialism or the idea of developing some kind of a normative materialism. Um, here I'm just um, in the very beginning and it's still related to uh, the work that I've done on progress, regression uh, and social change. Um, it, it, it implies a specific concept of, of social change as well as a concept of social forms of life as in inert bundles of practices that are at the intersection of nature and culture uh, in a certain way. But let me start now with Marx's idea of social change or Marx's idea of progressive social change. Uh, and then let me spell out how I think one can still relate to this even, uh, uh, of course, in a way that as well uh, needs to reconstruct uh, the basic ideas as yeah, at this, uh, in, uh, in some version, defended. So Marx obviously represents an idea of social change that includes all the well-known elements of the 19th century fascination with progress and modernity. When he says that, and this is the well-known uh, quote from the uh, Communist Manifesto, when he holds that the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production, thereby the relations of production, and with them the whole relations of society, when he holds that all fixed, fast, frozen relations with a train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away, all new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify, and famously all that is solid melts into the air, uh, he seems to defend an idea of uh, pro, uh, of, 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 of progress and of progressive social change that is linked to three of the main uh, dimensions, main components of this 19th century uh, fascination with progress. Namely, first, the idea that, as Stephen Lux puts it, the Enlightenment idea of an unbreakable chain linking economic growth, scientific growth, and the pursuit of social justice. And in some way, one can say that this Enlightenment ideal of this unbreakable chain uh, has only in and with and through Marx become uh, more substance. 
Second uh, of those dimensions, the, the second and third, the irresistibility of what is going on here. Uh, if all that is solid melts into the air, if everything is swept away, you get this, uh, uh, this idea of irresistibility. Uh, these things happen, uh, we don't even know um, who does it or who's involved in it, they just happen, they sweep us away uh, in some way. And then, of course, the idea of a de developmental logic uh, that is connected to uh, certain elements of uh, philosophy of history. It is clear that he somehow defends an accumulative idea of social change, uh, including the idea of developmental stage when he talks about what he calls the civilizational sides of capital. And of course, he also uh, talks about the exploitative sides of, of, of capital famously, but uh, when he mentions the civilizational sides of capital uh, that creates the material conditions for even overcoming capitalism, while this overcoming is conceived of just not just a rupture or break, leading to a better society, but as a transition to what he calls a higher form of society. Uh, so this is, an, I mean, of course, the, an, uh, an indicator for this idea of developmental uh, uh, change or of development that uh, has been so important for the Enlightenment idea of progress as well. Um, and all of this has, for good reasons, as I might say, been subject to heavy criticism. Heavy criticism for its Eurocentrism, for its imperialism, uh, the well-known remark by Chakrabarti about developmental approaches uh, that put some societies in uh, what he famously called the waiting room of history. This remark seems to hit the, pot, uh, the spot here. And Marx is in some ways an easy target here. So there are more, there's more than one strategy to um, <clears throat> defend uh, Marx here or to decolonize Marx uh, in some way. Uh, for example, of, which would be the first strategy to show how he himself has modified and relativized this developmental uh, approach uh, that still uh, assumes like necessary stages uh, of history that have to, uh, have to be undergone. So for this, uh, the then often quoted letters to Vera Sasulic are uh, famously, it's, it's something that uh, uh, famously is argued with, and as for me, um, I think, I mean, fine with me, it is a good proof of the, let's say, empirical character of Marx's philosophy of history, or for the fact that it's not just a Hegelian philosophy of history, even if, if uh, Hegel, the Hegel story is much more complicated than this, uh, but something that uh, meets resistance from uh, reality or from the way uh, that those moments of change have actually uh, evolved in history. My problem with this strategy, or the reason why I'm not going for this here, is uh, that by somehow deflating or lowering uh, the burdens of philosophy of history here, it is also in danger of eliminating what I take to be a very important dimension of a critical theory of society as it comes from uh, Marx, a materialistic theory of social change, uh, under which, uh, uh, in, a, in a first attempt, I just uh, uh, mean not a voluntaristic, not an idealistic uh, theory of social change. So my strategy here, or my, uh, uh, the way I, uh, 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 what I want to do here is to defend, to some extent, historical materialism as a theory of progressive social change, and to try to reconstruct those dimensions that I think uh, uh, we should hold on to on the basis of a practice theoretical form of life approach here. So this is uh, an approach that goes against the orthodox determinism, also to a certain extent uh, against a certain understanding of a logical necessity in history. Thomas was already uh, talking about a practical necessity, it's a necessity that is not strictly logical, but something that uh, maybe we can see um, uh, from uh, uh, in, in, in retrospect, uh, and also to reconstruct this then fragile logics of history as a multiplicity of attempts at problem solving, and as for the project in general, my idea here is that we should give up the substantial 
idea of progress and go for uh, uh, um, an account that that talks about learning processes, the dynamics of learning processes or experiential processes as such and takes its clue uh, in order to come up with criteria for progressive or regressive uh, social change from the very dynamics uh, themselves, the way it evolves. So as against the widespread tendency to identify every kind of developmental plot uh, by association as colonial or imperialist uh, and thereby being in danger of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, I would say, and my claim is that critical theory needs a concept of progressive and regressive social change and that it uh, needs a concept of progress and emancipation that we use them neither as a fact nor as an ideal in order to uh, evoke a, a distinction that Amy Allen, who is here and who is going to, who I will be very happy to, uh, to share in the next session. Uh, so in, 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 in my opinion, it's progress is neither a fact nor an ideal, but it is was Marx, what Marx uh, stated with respect to communism. It's the real movement, or if it is, if there is a possibility of, uh, uh, um, I'm spelling out the criterion, it should be the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. This is what uh, Marx said about communism. <clears throat> so while one here has to take into account the normative embeddedness of Hegel's and Marx's concept of the real, when talking about the real movement, uh, they do not only mean the simply given, uh, but the real, as you know, is itself a normative concept here. But I think something like this and something that uh, refers to a tendency, a potential, not just some kind of ideal or hope, but of course also not uh, to the fact of uh, progress or emancipation alone. So how, how can we conceive of progressive or probably more often even regressive social change as the real movement which abolishes the present state of things? I will to a certain extent also defend uh, the idea of an unbreakable chain, uh, which I take as one uh, dimension of the uh, materialist insights here, as well as shed new light on this accumulative dynamics. First part, marks on moral progress. So here I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to spell out how uh, some insights of Marx with respect to uh, how moral progress uh, evolves is something that we can work with. In an article that has, has had a major impact, especially on the current discussion of moral progress in the US, American philosopher Elizabeth Beth Anderson asks, how can historical processes of contestation over moral principles lead groups to change their moral beliefs? My answer to this question with and against Marx will be change in a society's moral beliefs occurs only when it is not moral beliefs alone that change. Moral change is not exclusively due to disputes over moral principles and claims, but to the change of entire contexts of practice. In other words, moral progress does not unfold autonomously. It does not proceed endogenously, but stands in the context of a changing ethical form of life. Conversely, such, such a form of life is just that, an ethical form of life in whose practices normative self-understandings are embedded, in which norms are thus embodied. The change we are asking about is therefore a multi-dimensional multi process in which different dynamics of change interact and influence each other. The site of the change we call progress is thus identified as the complex web of interwoven practices and beliefs that can be called a social form of life. Note that what I call form of life here is not the cultural as against the material or economical side, but includes economical, uh, economical, political, cultural, social practices. I will approach this thesis with Marx and somehow from the margins. In the third volume of Marx Capital, we find the following in many ways remarkable statement. I quote, from the standpoint of a higher socioeconomic formation, the private property of particular individuals in the earth will appear just as distasteful, in German this is abgeschmackt, as the private property of one man and other men. What interests me about this quotation is less the character of the earth as property, as important as it is, 
than a small at first sight inconspicuous but nevertheless quite astounding accentuation. Marx claims here that the notion that human beings could fall under the legal form of private property must seem distasteful to us today. This way of describing our attitude towards slavery is somehow disconcerting. Most of us surely think, as Marx certainly also did, that private property of other human beings, enslavement or servitude, is not only somehow distasteful but profoundly abhorrent. Why does Marx use what is in effect an aesthetic category, distasteful, to refer to such a degradation of persons? It is as if, if he were talking about a mere lapse of taste, a somehow inappropriate, despicable, deflated, but also slightly ridiculous, ugly, vulgar social institution, or even one lacking in style. I suspect that this expression was no mere slip of the pen of such a great polemicist and stylist as Marx was. That ownership of human beings now strikes us as distasteful indicates that today the institution of slavery is in a certain sense completely unthinkable for us. As something distasteful, this institution is not only morally outrageous, but it is no longer intellig intelligible in the in Hegelian terms, ethical context of practice, beliefs, and institutions in which we live. To treat a human being as property, to treat someone as a thing, therefore, is not, for example, worse or less bad than deceiving him, stealing from him, or murdering him. In so far as slavery has been overcome, it is notwithstanding that it still exists. As the numbers of human beings living under conditions of modern slavery show us, it is a category mistake. And modern slavery, by the way, is just that. Modern slavery is slavery under modern conditions, legally prohibited and working within a modern a new infrastructure. So this, so this doesn't make it less bad, but it's a different kind of institution, I would claim. So therefore, when Marx asserts that from the standpoint of a higher socioeconomic formation, the private property of particular individuals in the earth will appear just as distasteful as the private property of one man and other men, he means today private ownership of the earth seems to us to be completely unproblematic and without alternative. Unable to imagine a different relation to the world than that of property, it does not dawn on us that this could be even a problem. But a different time and a different social order are conceivable in which precisely this basic understanding and agreement will have changed, just as already occurred with regard to ownership of human beings. Understood in this way, the designation distasteful points to the ethical background conditions, the changes in the proto-values of the society and possibly also in its fundamental social ontology that make the institutions and practices described possible or impossible, conceivable or inconceivable at a basic level. But then, how do we get from here to there? It seems to be something about the phenomenology of our moral experience that in particular when it comes to what are for us such salient moral wrongs, we are sometimes confronted with changes that seem at first sight to present us with something like a gestalt switch, like the famous Doug Rabbit switch. At the same time, however, the Marxian interpretation, uh, interpretation as against, for example, uh, something that we can uh, take from Rorty, suggests that we are not dealing with an unconnected paradigm shift but with a motivated and intelligible transition. As is well known, the Marxian solution to the problem is to claim that underlying the seemingly abrupt change in our moral sensibility is a material transformation that follows an intelligible and necessary logic. The social dynamic involved then doesn't originate from a transformation of our moral sensitivity itself, but stems from somewhere else, the development of the forces of production whereas morality or ideology as such does not have a history, hence a dynamic of its own. Now, there are a number of reasons why I do not want to embrace or even, because it's well known, uh, further discuss this whole orthodox materialist nar narrative in its one-sided determinism or simple base superstructure model. Nevertheless, the insight that changes in our moral conceptual world are not purely endogenous phenomena, but that they are interconnected with other social changes seems to me to merit serious consideration, and I think we can rebuild the argument from that. Thus, we can derive a first thesis about the dynamics of moral progress from this first approximation inspired by Marx. Moral progress, this thesis asserts, does not stand on its own. 
It is framed by social contexts and background conditions and is reliant on them, even if moral virtuosi exist whose judgment is ahead of their social context. Therefore, the change in the normative evaluation of institutions and in their practically effective form described as progress would not be the result of a freestanding moral insight or of a freestanding development of the faculty of moral empathy. It would instead be the effect of a change of whole social formations, of a change in the surrounding or adjacent practices and of the social horizon of interpretation within which the practices in question can be understood and stabilized. Thus, morally relevant practices and interpretations are connected with a whole variety of other practices and interpretations within an ensemble of practices which bear on the domain of morality, but also in part on much more wide-ranging life problems and also include technical skills, economical practices, and the material with which we deal practically. It is when a whole constellation changes that a specific moral institution can become peculiar, weird, repugnant, or even outlandish. And as for that, can be thematized, rejected, and denounced by social actors or social movements. This ensemble structure that we encounter here is diverse. Moral practices and interpretations exert influences on other practices and are influences influenced by the latter in turn. They make other practices possible and are made possible by them in turn. Some of these practices are functionally interconnected or interwoven, but there are also elements that just fit together somehow, that are interlinked, stabilize each other, or belong to the same context of interpretation in a broader sense. And because practices are never raw facts, but are always interpreted as something, the possible interpretations change along with the constellation of practices involved. Thus, if moral practices are framed in a context of other practices, then they are also interpreted from out of this context and are intelligible within it. The formation of our moral sense, of our faculty of moral perception that we ask about above, then is, not an, is exactly not an unmediated gestalt switch that leads from one moral evaluation of a situation to another. It is actually not merely a change in our moral sense or moral awareness after all. Instead, it can be attributed to the change in the background conditions, the subsequent practices and interpretations. Some of them are normative, some of them are also uh, include also like knowledge about the world or uh, our interpretation about uh, uh, what the world is like, which transforms the surroundings of the morally relevant practice in such a way that they appear in a different light. However, now the question arises, of course, how, of how these changes, the transformations of such ensembles can be conceived. Thus, our initial question about the genesis of moral change has shifted to the question of social change, its interrelation with moral change and its dynamic in general. The concept, conception of social contexts of practice suggested here yields some initial clues for answering these questions. If different practices are interconnected in the ways described, then the changes that they undergo can be explained in terms of shifts in a nexus of practices, shifts which are caused by the dissolution of the relevant relations of fit, tangents or even, as Marx then would have it, contradictions between coexisting practices and their interpretations. Still, if we try to understand the I try to understand the ensemble structure in a looser and more open sense, a weaker version of the idea of relations of fit, and conversely of mismatches between practices and practices uh, and ideas seem to me, uh, seems to me still inst instructive. If one inquires into changes that actually happened in the practical field, one will actually often observe that in such situations relations of fit have become eroded and correspondingly vulnerable. New practices and new technologies are added to an ensemble of practices and interpretations. The conditions under which the latter are exercised as well as their interpretation undergo change. Some practices fit into the ensemble, whereas others seem to break it apart, so that in some cases an entire context or nexus of social practices undergoes a complete or partial shift. A well-documented example of this is the social shifts in gender relations that occurred during and after World War II as a consequence of women entering into work relations that had previously been close to them and assuming sole responsibility for the upkeep of the family. But even aside from such dramatic impulses, social relations of work can change in such a way 
that the institution of the head of household and the housewife marriage no longer fits or fits only poorly into social life. But at first sight, inconspicuous technical inventions can also trigger social and moral changes. What makes the television series Downtown Abbey so ingenious in its depiction of how love, war, radio, the telephone, and the typewriter combined with the ineffectiveness of aristocratic agri agriculture generate an irresistible dynamic of transformation that undermined and would ultimately destroy the way of life of the English aristocracy. Thus, there are shifts in structures of practices caused by developments, innovations of different kinds of crisis involving change or the detachment of individual moments from structures of practice, which leads to changes in a whole ensemble of practices and their interpretations. Spaces or gaps open up as a result. Now, I have in so far, so far intentionally referred to the, those shifts and relations of fit and possible mismatches in a broad and rather vague sense. But as, is, as it is well known, Marx has a very specific relation of fit in mind when he expresses pointedly, perhaps even somewhat overpointedly, as follows. I quote, the hand mill gives you society with the feudal lord, the steam mill society with the industrial capitalist. The dissolution of this relation of fit, which in this case is a relation of functional conditioning, now gives rise to the dynamic of change. Maintaining feudal relations under conditions of the steam mill would, uh, according to this uh, quote, be a mismatch leading to social upheavals and ultimately to a social revolution. Or to put it in terms of historical materialism, the development of the forces of production represents a dynamic within which the relations of production that no longer correspond to these forces become dysfunctional and a fetter on their further development. While I, outli while I outlined above how changes are expressed and might made possible by the fact that f uh, relations of fit between practices are disturbed, um, this, uh, this explanation, of course, is much <coughs> sorry, um, uh, is much more uh, deterministic. They don't, do, not, uh, do, no, do not simply fit uh, each other in the vague sense I've applied here, that is in such a way that they do not interfere with each other, rather they enable, condition, or require, even require each other. Marx speaks, speaks here of one yielding the other. We have on the un one hand the handmill together with its characteristic practices, technical skills, and the way of organizing labor resulting from the operation of handmills. On the other hand, we are confronted with the feudal order, its social power relations and hierarchies, its distribution of economic and political influence, and its characteristic property relations and ways of life. Both are now related to each other in such a way that one side makes the other side possible, or requires it, or even, to put it in increasingly demanding terms, produces it. There is thus a functional relationship between the hand mill and feudal society on the one hand and the steam engine and bourgeois society on the other. The one exists in order to maintain the other, the one, the one is at least a necessary if not sufficient condition for the existence of the other. The existence of the other can be explained by the existence of the one. <coughs> a constellation pressing for change emerges. The maintenance of feudal relations under conditions of the steam engine, engine is a mismatch, but as I said, a very specific mismatch that leads to social dislocation. <coughs> Sorry. Now, as Louis Althusser and a lot of others already notes, this is virtually a caricature of the materials conception of history, an image that is already clearly more differentiated than Marx himself and has undergone complex interpretations in a multitude of attempts from Althusser to Habermas and Stuart Hall, to name only some prominent attempts. For such a less deterministic reconstruction of the content, the following key points can be given. The first is reciprocity. While orthodox historical materialism assumes a one-sided conditional relationship between the development of productive forces and relations of production, a reduced or extended version assumes a reciprocal re relationship. In this case, not only one side, that of the productive forces, is dynamic, while the other side is static, only reacting to the actual source of the dynamics. Rather, both sides are dynamic and intertwined in their dynamics such that they have an effect on each other. 
In other words, technical developments, for example, are always technical social developments. If in China in the ninth, uh, in, in the ninth uh, century, black powder, gunpowder was already known, but was initially used primarily for fireworks and ritual purposes, or if the steam engine has already been invented in antiquity, but then in ancient times, but then instead of triggering the dynamics, it was later to develop in the context of industrialization, if it served merely to produce effects and to amuse in the theater, this shows that the development and dynamics of technical innovations is not only dependent on an economic problem pressure, but always also on social contexts that embed these innovations in certain contexts of use and enable their further development and application in certain contexts of practice. The steam engine, considered by Marx to be the decisive moment of the bourgeois industrial revolution, promotes the transformation to bourgeois capitalist society, but it too depends on accommodating contexts and connecting practices that form the ensembles of forms of life. Just as moral progress depends on social contexts, so does economic pro progress. <coughs> Secondly, the dissolution of the strict conditional relationship. Where an orthodox version of historical materialism assumes a strictly functional conditional relation between productive forces and relations of production, the extended version conceives of this as an enabling relation. The change of one side is not the necessary and sufficient condition for the reaction of the other, but it makes it possible to put it in a much reduced uh, formulation. Makes it possible, it makes, makes possible the emergence uh, and um, the, the sustaining of it. The handmill then does not necessitate feudal society in the sense of forcing it. The steam engine does not result in bourgeois society. It enables or suggests or frames it. However, insofar as it necessitates a reaction at all, because problems arise from certain forms of non-reaction, a very weak logic of events is nevertheless indicated here. Third point, functional equivalence. A narrowly defined functional relation, a functional necessity which is accessible to the corresponding functional explanation, has thus become an extended version of functionalism also in, this respe in the respect that it assumes the existence of functional equivalence. That there exists not only one possible reaction to an existing problem, but several in each case. Thus, there is a variance within a spectrum of adjustments that are suitable in a functional sense. The handmill can yield feudal society, but, it all, but also other forms of social organization. And the steam engine, even where it leads to industrial capitalism, leads at least to varieties of capitalism, but sometimes to nothing at all. And one and the same problem can, in other words, have different functionally equivalent solutions, from which, however, different further problems and dynamics and different and a multiplicity of, of, uh, of, of, of dynamics arise. This, to sum it up, is a revised version of the vulgar Marxist-based superstructure model that aims at spelling out the interdependencies, the set of practices and structures framing other sets of practices while still granting a relative autonomy to each of them. If moral progress takes place in the context of comprehensive changes in many different areas of life, then it does not immediately follow that there is indeed an inseparable chain or a direct causal relationship between the individual processes of social change, as the philosophy of progress of the 18th and 19th century assumed, it does not follow that the steam engine directly causes the overcoming of feudalism and that solidarity springs directly from, uh, from factor work and thus uh, uh, another kind of social relations. The chain is not unbreakable, but rather fragile. And it is perhaps not always a chain, but sometimes rather a complicated web with some knotenpunkten and with many open threads. Still, I think it's worth to think, uh, think about um, social change in terms of uh, those connections and in terms of this, uh, even if fragile, chain. How am I in terms of time? Yeah. Ten moments, wonderful. So, social change. A tentative theory, theory of social change, roughly pragmatist in spirit, then evolves. Social transformations do not arise out of nothing. They are motivated by problems and crises such that existing practices and institutions no longer function or confront a problem they cannot solve. 
Social and moral change becomes possible where there is a mismatch between different social practices and institutions, thus where the relation of fit between them is no longer exact. It becomes necessary when the erosion of social institutions and practices calls for the formation of new institutions. If social change is triggered by crises and upheavals, it is a response to the need to adapt to social situations that have become unclear, hence to problems in the pragmatist sense or even contradictions in the Hegelian and Marxian sense. The question of how social change occurs then does not take the form, why is it changing at all? Rather, social formations present themselves as intrinsically dynamic formations which are driven beyond themselves by problems of all kinds in a crisis-prone dynamic. Progressive social change, then, is a dynamic with an already dynamic situation. As for the role of social movements in human agent, a multi-level picture comes into view. If the possibility of change, the possibility of turning moral wrong into an object of opprobrium, as feminists did in the case of rape and revolting slaves and abolitionists in that of slavery, it is bound up with shifts and with disjointed relations of fit, as I've argued. It is both correct and a simplification to say that social change rests on social struggles or social movements. Neither the existence nor the success of social movements rests exclusively on the will and resoluteness of the actors involved. These will depend rather on social and material enabling conditions that must be fulfilled if social actors are to be able to make practical interventions. Against the voluntaristic interpretation of social change, <clears throat> social change following Marx calls as much for a passive as for an active element. Or, put differently, social conflicts and struggles contribute to changing the aggregate state of possibly latent crisis or phenomena of erosion. Contradiction as the objective side of a crisis thus itself has a subjective side precisely because it is reflexively constituted as a contradiction and is based on claims to validity. These must also be asserted, raised by social actors, made into conflict by them. So we have both sides, the objective side, the subjective side, uh, the passive element and the active element as they are uh, uh, multiply intertwined. <laughs> In my understanding now, it has been a practice theoretical framework that allows us to reconstruct the web of interdependencies that together are the preconditions, the passive element of social change, as well as the dynamics of social change. So two suggestions, and I'm being, uh, going to be very short here. Uh, I want to understand forms of life as inert bundles and ensembles of practices. This is some, uh, an understanding that has al uh, already been implicit in uh, what I was talking about, and forms of life as problem-solving. So what then are forms of life? In the context of my account, the term form of life refers to a cultural, culturally shaped order of human coexistence, which encompasses an ensemble of practices and orientations as well as the institutional manifestations and materializations. Differences amongst forms of life are not only expressed by different beliefs, values, and attitudes, they are also manifested and materialized in fashion, architecture, juridical and economical systems, and family organization. As the forms in which we live, forms that give shape to our life, they are part of the sphere of objective spirit, or they belong to the, as Hannah Arendt would say, particularly human world, that world in which human beings make their lives and which is shaped by their activities. So forms of life contain the cultural and social reproduction of human life. <clears throat> so how do we understand the inner structure and characteristics of forms of life? The uh, formula that I suggest here is to understand forms of life as inert bundles or as ensembles of social practices, uh, which refers to a certain understanding of practices as uh, always already containing interpretations and always uh, being social uh, and public to a certain extent, so they are social not only when we cooperate, uh, like playing soccer together, but social because of uh, the background of a socially constituted realm of meaning. Uh, they are, which is uh, important for, uh, for, for, for setting them apart from uh, a certain understanding of producing one's life, they are not just intentional and also not just instrumental actions, they are patterns in which we act and as such are the very preconditions uh, under which we act. Finally, 
practices are regulated by uh, a certain kind of norms and have an inherent telos. Um, so what makes, the, in, in which respect is this a materialist conception? Forms of life, as forms of life, but also, as forms of life, but also forms of life, are in the intersection between nature and culture. They are historicized, but at the same time, uh, uh, they work as against what Thomas has called uh, the resistance of, uh, of, uh, of reality in some way. So in my view, it does not make sense to talk about human life in a pure sense in which it would not already have a distinctive form. Uh, on the other side, life and the reproduction of life is one of the constraining elements. We do not invent our forms of life. Uh, they evolve in a certain way. Uh, there is a resistance, something that is not of our own making and that we have to react to. Marx again, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already given and transmitted from the past. And I think this is something that uh, the idea of forms of life as inert bundles of practices um, <clears throat> uh, somehow uh, lives up to, even if there is a uh, modification with respect to uh, what Marx would say when he uh, famously in the so-called uh, German ideology claims that uh, men become <coughs> a distinct in, uh, human agents uh, as soon as they produce, they start producing their lives. I think uh, the uh, practical theoretical understanding of forms of life uh, implies that uh, the idea that men produce their lives has to, re uh, to be replaced by men practically engaging with the world and thereby shape their life themselves and the world they live in. So in some sense, they are only co-authors uh, in at least two respects. They do it together with others. They do it uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in terms of already historically given circumstances and they react to those circumstances. So in some way, they shape uh, uh, their world and they are shaped. So replacing production here seems to be in line with the materialist insight. I would say, of course, there's, there's a long uh, debate about labor and production and the instrument, uh, instrumental character of it. I would think that replacing this uh, in terms of practice um, provides us a better way to, to deal with uh, the resistance of reality and the uh, experiential uh, aspect of what it means to uh, labor and to confront this resistance. Secondly, I would, uh, I would uh, conceive of forms of life as problem-solving, crisis-driven uh, entities, as, uh, as I already referred to uh, with respect to social change. And I think of this as a somehow undercover Marxist materialist approach to social change, exactly because this means there are problems uh, we start with problems, problems uh, that are uh, in the midst of everything, uh, not something like uh, uh, problems stemming from nature that is pre-given, uh, but something where uh, a logic where uh, forms of life respond to problems confronting our species and our attempts to solve these problems. But at the same time, they are always specific and they both face and pose those problems. Uh, again, <clears throat> just a, a final remark uh, with respect to the dynamics and, and, and the way that I think uh, that understanding uh, uh, of forms of life as problem-solving entities and, under and the understanding of social change in terms of a crisis dynamic, uh, a problem-solving crisis dynamic. Uh, just a last remark uh, about um, how this might solve the problem of a teleological uh, philosophy of history or a teleological idea of development. Uh, this, um, let's say, pragmatist dialectical understanding of problem solving and uh, problem solving that then uh, accumulates to solving problems of, of a second order, problems that we have uh, with uh, uh, solving problems and so on. Uh, I think this is um, in a variety of ways not a teleological account. It is an account that um, um, takes its clue from the idea that the path arises in walking, der Weg muss im Gehen entstehen, uh, and this, I think, is a non-teleological version of uh, how 
uh, those processes evolve uh, with, a, again, a fragile kind of logic in retrospect, but at the same time, uh, one can then make, uh, under the term, or with this perspective of, of problem solving, one can then <clears throat> make sense of the logics of uh, change and of the erosion and transformation of institution and practices that does not leave us without a clue. Thank you so much. Talk, I'm gonna take questions. Hello, is this yeah. working? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, sympathetic to the problem solving um, uh, way of thinking about social change and also um, the sort of emphasis you put on social movements. Um, my question is about um, the, what you think is um, what you think is bad about what you are characterizing as the orthodox vulgar determinist picture. I'm struck by the fact that I mean that you, your preferred. I mean, you're, you you were talking about bundles and ensembles of practices, and um, I mean, it's one thing that's characteristic of a bundle, for example, of dirty clothes or twigs. Or, um, is that it doesn't have any particular uh, internal structure to speak of. Um, um, an ensemble doesn't suggest any particular kind of order, internal order. Um, and that seems very different from um, the, what you get from a picture that includes concepts like forces of production, relations of production. Um, and, uh, um, and I'm just wondering if you think that any um, articulation, structural articulation of the elements of the ensemble is ipso facto determinist, vulgar, and problematic. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I mean, as you, as you see, this is, I mean, I start with a somehow, somehow deflated version, and uh, you might think it's too defensive. May, maybe it's too defensive um, uh, in a room where people are already, I mean, are not, like, um, uh, opposed to this at all. I think it's, it makes sense to, or my strategy here is to somehow break it up from a deflated version and then uh, come up with... Um, um, uh, the concrete way those uh, practices and structures are actually related to each other. Um, you are right about the bundles, and I actually I, I should try to avoid the um, <clears throat> the concept of a bundle because I myself have actually replaced it by I think it should be replaced by ensemble. Um, ensemble, I think, is a I mean, is much better because bundle is just I mean, yeah, a bunch of things that I mean. Well, in some way, I mean, even is, is only bundled together by an, by an outside force. So um, ensemble, I think, is a, is a good, um, for me, ensemble is, is a good alternative to, um, again, a deflated alternative to what otherwise would be uh, some idea of organism, uh, where everything has a specific function and hangs together by way of serving this function. Uh, this seems to be, I mean, of course, this is in the background, and 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 to even talk about functions uh, uh, in, in in a holistic sense evokes this kind of of, uh, of unity and of totality, and of, and I think, I mean, my my attempt here is to come up with a loser understanding of it, but still, I think, in an ensemble, uh, it is not without uh, it's it's it's. Um, I think it, it it has a certain sense that sometimes think of a of, a, of an orchestra. Sometimes we think we, we would even describe an orchestra that uh, um, that has a very good like way of playing together good sound and so on. We would even uh, think of it again as some like organic unity or something. But it is a loser structure at the same time. So an ensemble, every every instrument plays a part and a certain um, Result only uh, a, a, a certain a certain kind kind of um, I mean the the, the 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 piece of music will only evolve out of working together of those different parts. But at the same time, uh, what I was referring to is uh, I mean the the already functional equivalence of course uh, plays a certain role. You can. I don't know. I mean, like like a high voice, you can replace this. 
I mean, you can 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 use violence in order to uh, um, uh, uh, to produce a certain sound. You can also use other instruments who have uh, who are at the same level. Just, I mean, trying to spell out the metaphor. I think uh, there is a. Um, uh, there is a, is a structure that is not as strong as an organic structure, but at the same time, things hang together in a certain way. And what I want to do, and this also uh, goes back to your question, what is so bad about the orthodox uh, picture, I want to uh, give room for a variety of, of connections and relations that are in play here. I'm also, I mean... In some way, I'm still when I when I talk about crisis and dysfunctionality of of, of a social order that then uh, gives rise to social change. Um, I don't know. We we have had so many discussions now with uh, Sally about the very uh, concept of contradiction. And in the beginning, she always said, ah, "Contradiction! You lefty galleons, you always uh, want." Uh, things to go wrong because they are contradictory because of contradictions, but there's so many ways uh, that uh, things can go wrong without any contradiction in play. And I think it's 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 uh, relevant to it's it's a. I still think that some of the major social changes are triggered by something that at least comes close to some kind of uh, maybe if not strict. Uh, but some kind of a contradiction. Uh, there are so many contradictory elements in our uh, social order, and I do think that it's uh, it's worth to have a look at those contradictions as producing uh, the necessity of social change that then may occur or not. Um, uh, but at the same time, I want to have a, a broader, a more pluralist picture about how these things can hang together. I mean, one thing... There might there might all, always be functional equivalence. Then, of course, the path dependency of you have a certain solution to a certain problem, and then the next problem, as a result of this uh, this very problem solution, uh, comes up, and then I mean, and in the end, we have a variety of those uh, um, uh, logics of, I mean, how things. Uh, uh, have evolved in, in societies, which is also important for me in, in terms of how to, I mean, to uh, to get back the, uh, to the question of the um, imperialism of the idea of progress, of the idea of, of development, and so on. I think it's important to, in the end, have a have a picture that allows for a multiplicity of developments that, at the same time, hang together. But again. Uh, some of them hang together in a, in a stricter in a strict way. Some of them hang together in a looser way. Some are just informed by each other, and so on. So this is the. I mean, the idea is just to have a an open um, um, uh, picture, or, or let's say an open p perspective on it. And uh, the stricter, the the more the more. Um, I would say that uh, the, the functionalist elements uh, are part of it, but are surrounded somehow by by others, and then interfere with others who are not as uh, in, in such a strict sense. Uh, so that's I mean the idea is to loosen I mean to, to have a have a more pluralist and and a, and a picture that is open as against a strictly deterministic and strictly organicist or uh, whatever idea of how those ensembles hang together. Okay, we're gonna take um, the the remaining questions, but maybe um, yes. okay. so if we want to, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, I have actually, I have a, like I think uh, two intertwined questions. Uh, uh, as quick as possible. As quick as possible. They're, they're really, really short questions. Okay. Uh, the, the first question is like, who actually are these uh, like vulgar Marxists uh, that that you defend or try to defend materialism against because. Um, like I, it, it's obviously not Marx. It's obviously not Engels. It's obviously not Lenin. It, it's obviously not not even Stalin has a kind of that mm -hmm. that kind of one dimensional um, uh, thoughts on socialism. And then the second uh, question, um, obviously coming out of that, would be what is actually like the the, the surplus value of this of this plurality in approaches? Because, um, like how I understand it, like the the. It would deprive Marxism of its really uh, of its of its revolutionary kernel, which is actually, I think, um, its its teleological dimension or even its uh, eschatological dimension. Right to see, like uh, as Benjamin put it, the revolution is not the um, the, the locomotive of 
of history, but the the um, the grab for the uh, for the emergency brake, right? Um, and if you don't take Marxism seriously in this kind of um, strive for a, for an absolutely different form of society, then um, like kind of your assessment of of uh, of loose loose bundles of life forms and kind of crisis and and problem solving and so on um, would actually not be a, kind of a, a, an undercover Marxism, but but uh, the other way around, kind of a conservatism uh, of it is how it is that tries to cloak itself in kind of Marxist uh, concepts. Yeah, so, um, yeah. But maybe you can uh, elaborate on that a bit further. And maybe, I mean, to the first question, very quick, I have met some. <laughs> uh, which would be the shortcut. Um, uh, then the question, what is the surplus plus value? I mean, I think what, what um, I mean, for, I mean to, to, to your last remark, I don't see anything that prevents us from uh, aiming at a completely different uh, world with, I mean, I don't see why this would uh, count out uh, the idea of revolutionary change. I mean, even if um, the idea of problem solving seem, seems to be uh, uh, I mean, in, 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 in your terms, uh, reformist in terms of, okay, so, I mean, there are problems where we're going to solve them, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and this is how a social change comes about, uh, comes about. This is not actually part of the picture. I would say that um, problem solving can go, like, can, 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 can go in a smooth way where you, have, where you are just coming up with problems within a given framework, but at a certain point, uh, problem solving can also lead to, uh, this is then what I would call, I mean, with the concept of a crisis, can lead to crises that, are, uh, that cannot be solved within the given framework. This is then something that occurs on what, what I would call, I mean, this uh, uh, um, a crisis of the second order, where the whole paradigm doesn't, I mean, that doesn't uh, provide you with the means uh, of, of, of solving a crisis. So, and this is something like a revolution. I mean, this is another way to uh, uh, to spell out what a revolution is. So, I don't see that um, this account, in principle, would prevent us from uh, going for. <clears throat> revolutionary change, the only thing that is, prevents us from, but, but this is, I think is very much in line with Marx, uh, to think of revolutions as something that is purely, uh, that, that is a discontinuity, that is like the pure new innovation, I mean an innovation that comes out of nowhere. And I take it to be a very interesting Marxist point and something that we hold on to, that this is not the case, that social change and even revolutions don't come out of nothing in a certain way, that they react to uh, uh, to crisis and contradictions on the, let's say, objective side of things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you might say uh, this is, uh, you, you, you might want the more, uh, let's say, innovative, accelerated uh, um, a kind of a likeness uh, idea of revolution, but here I would think it is very much in line uh, with a Marxian, Hegelian already a Marxian approach to uh, to have this kind of the transition from uh, um, to, to to come up with an idea where continuity and discontinuity are somehow intertwined. So the new, the revolution is as at the same time uh, continuous as as it is discontinuous in some way. So I don't, yeah, again, I don't see where I mean whether I, I <clears throat> or uh, why I would have placed my stakes on the reformist side here, but we might talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, the idea of reformist, non-reformist reforms when it comes to what is it that we should expect or go for, but whatever, this is, I think, is a different uh, discussion. And then last point, um, I mean, what is the, what does it, uh, if, if, um, what is the, the, the um, surplus value of this? I think it's important to, in a, it, it always depends on to whom you're talking to and, and which kind of discussion you are uh, intervening at. I think there is a huge uh, tendency to uh, not only a certain kind of idealism in the um, discussion about social change and about especially moral progress, it's not only that 
the role of social movements is very often left out. It's also that uh, 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 there is a certain, I mean, in an uh, old-fashioned uh, term, idealistic tendency to it, and the uh, the question of how the material side and the other uh, 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 the other side hangs together is, I think. Still open and should still be um, um, be of our concern, and this even holds for uh, the enthusiasm about social movements, which I to a certain uh, extent share. I mean, that's where I'm coming from. But at the same time, uh, I think that it's um, important to. I mean, maybe it's it's something like a swing. It's at some moments uh, uh, in history. <clears throat> critical theory is uh, like more on the side of, let's say, the subjective factor, the subjective dimension, uh, social movements conceived of in, in, in voluntaristic terms, and sometimes it's uh, it goes uh, in the direction of the so-called objective side of the. You could could also name it like between crisis and conflict. And my claim here, or my intervention here, is that in a, in a situation where I do think that there is a there is a strongly voluntaristic element in a lot of uh, 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 theories of of uh, social movements, of social change, in a lot of what we are talking about when we when we talk about how should the huge transformation that obviously is. Uh, uh, is necessary, uh, how should this go on? I think uh, the idea, I mean, to rethink what Marx has in mind with the passive and the active element uh, being intertwined or having to work together is something that is uh, worth doing in order to avoid a certain kind of moralism, in order to avoid a certain kind of voluntarism, uh, and in order to avoid a situation where we uh, restrict ourselves to, uh, let's say, the, the idea that progress, for example, or progressive social change is only uh, is something that uh, we can, can only judge upon uh, on a local level. That's what I... So thank you for a very interesting talk. So just a quick question. Uh, would you accept the proposition that all social change comes unconsciously? That that, that means that the, the actors, the social movements, they are aware what they're fighting for, but they are never aware of the exact, the exact course why they have these ideas that they are proposing. Yeah, the question was, uh, would you accept the proposition that uh, the social progressive change comes unconsciously in the sense that the social movements, they know... Unconsciously, yeah. Yeah, so the social movements, they know what they're fighting for, but the members, they are not aware of the material causes of the ideas that they have in their mind. No, I, I would say it's neither consciously nor unconsciously. It's something where... Um, it's, a whole variety of social changes and the social dynamic works together in order to make uh, those moments where um, social movements and social social actors take up an issue and, I mean, do something with this, fight for something and so on. I think it's a whole, a whole bunch of uh, uh, preconditions that come together and some of them are conscious I mean, sometimes it's 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 a conscious effort and something uh, that has to do with uh, collective self-understanding and determination and uh, I mean uh, trying to figure out a strategy and sometimes, but it's at the same time uh, the very precondition for this to arise is also a product of sometimes non-intentional consequences. I mean, it can famously. I mean, I was referring to the Downton Abbey. Um, and maybe it's a stupid uh, a series, but it's very interesting to see how, how so. I mean, things like the typewriter, and this is actually something that in the in the history of the early uh, 20th century uh, for the liberation of women has played a, an enormous role. That there have been, I mean, the, there was the typewriter. There have been those. Uh, so, so the idea that uh, of, of male secretaries was replaced uh, by the idea that uh, all these uh, women uh, writing with a typewriter would uh, uh, would be in those offices. So this has created a whole world of opportunities for for women in order to, yeah, I mean, then at at some point also uh, self-consciously uh, uh, um, I mean, becoming aware of the situation, fighting for something and so on. So this is the kind of uh, dynamics that I have in mind where, where um, certain uh, dynamics that are not 
directly intended to uh, uh, to, to uh, facilitate like social progressive social change or emancipatory social change, nevertheless somehow depend on those uh, background conditions. So it's both. Karen. Thanks. I, I I read somewhere that the, the washing machine has done more to liberate and emancipate <laughs> human civilization than any other piece of technology. The pill. Uh, yeah, exactly. So th that's all. My my question was about. Um, I really loved this passage that was early in your paper where you quote Marx as talking about this idea of distastefulness. Um, and what's so great about it is you were talking in one of your in your replies that we want to avoid thinking to, to be moralistic especially when we think about the subjective side um, of of social change and social progress and I wondered so I, the question is to what extent does the aesthetic dimension change how we think about the sort of subjective the active and passive the subjective and objective sides of social change and would you want to say that there is something like aesthetic progress, um, given that, you know, yeah, because I, I, I think this passage, you're right, it's got to be really important. And there's a reason he chooses this term distasteful. Um, it's, it's, it's a very accurate characterization. Um, <clears throat> yes and no. I would say, yes, aesthetic progress. Um, but in terms of a broad conception of aesthetics, uh, and a broad conception of, I mean, it has a lot to do with how we conceive the world, how our sensitivities uh, uh, are shaped. And this is, again, part of every form of life. I mean, a certain kind, a certain way to draw boundaries between, yeah, intelligible, non-intelligible, things that are distasteful, even like, I mean, uh, um, even when it comes to um, something, I mean, distasteful, disgusting. I mean, the, this whole area of uh, uh, of of, uh, of characterizations, I think, is is rich and important for, and is is surrounding some of our uh, normative or strictly normative notions. So there's no. I, I would say there's. Uh, it is important to uh, to open up the realm here for. Um, yeah, for this spectrum of, uh, uh, let's say, criteria. It's also, I mean, the term that I haven't uh, talked about that much, regression, as, I mean, the, the flip side of, um, uh, of, of, of progress is, in, in the same way, is somehow a very, I mean, a rich, uh, an ethically rich notion that uh, opens up if if you if you would uh, would would want to go for this opens up a whole range of um, aesthetic and normative judgments and one of my points here of course is always that those this is against the moralism those uh, judgments that on, on on first sight seem to be purely normative or seem to um, um, I mean I myself have a broader notion of normativity here but um, uh, those. Um, criteria that on, on, on first sight seem to belong strictly to the practical question, what should we do? Uh, this is actually not an adequate way to uh, to understand how normativity works here. It has a lot to do with how we see the world. It has a lot, and there your aesthetic dimension, I think, uh, comes in. It's also about knowledge. I mean, I would say that the fact that we are or at least that uh, there is a tendency of being less brutal to kids. I mean, the tendency for uh, a nonviolent education has has does not only have something to do with the fact that we are now like morally better or so. We know more about what kids are. We have a different understanding of childhood. We have a different understanding of what uh, those dependent human beings are like, from which kind of stuff they suffer, and so on. So this has, again, uh, and again, I would say it's uh, this would always it, it it would always be also be possible to uh, to broaden this. I mean, from like the kind of knowledge to the aesthetics of this knowledge to uh, certain kinds of sensitivity that again don't come out of nothing but are related to um, understandings. 
Um, Mas Kohana told me five zero five zero zero is four fifty nine. So I think we're gonna uh, stop here. <laughs> I'm uh, I felt really uh, that it was my mission. So uh, thank you very much, Rahel. It was very interesting.